All right, hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Games I Bought Recently. Now, I know last episode I told you that I would have had the second part uploaded within a week, which just never happened. I thought I had more free time than I actually did. So to make up for that, I am going to do everything for this episode all at once. I'm going to sit down and record everything instead of telling myself I'll do it later and then I just never get around to it. So this video, for once, I'm going to upload in its entirety, and I got a lot of games here, so I recommend that you just... Let this video play in the background while you play a game or straighten up your game room or something. So there's going to be not much of an order to it. I'm just going to be skipping around between different games, but I'm going to be going over my Black Friday pickups, um, my Wii U games, as well as import games, uh, retro games, all kinds of stuff in this episode. So let's get started with the Wii U. Yes, I did pick up a Wii U at launch. I did not have one pre-ordered, and at first I didn't think I was going to be able to get one. But all it took was waiting outside in the cold for three and a half hours, and I had my Wii U. Um, See, so yeah, I had to do a little bit of a lineup, but without a pre-order, that was the only way to really do it. And uh, the demand for the system really hasn't been as high as most people think. In some areas, you can walk into a store right now and pick one up, surprisingly. And in other areas, you can't get one f for anything. It's sold out everywhere. So I decided to get one because I can't miss out on a new console launch, and I was pretty excited for the Wii U, despite, you know, some of the launch games being... There weren't too many launch games for me personally. Um, but let's just start with New Super Mario Bros. U. This is a really fun game. It's actually very similar to New Super Mario Bros. Wii, which was a pretty fun game. This one is a bit better, though. I do like the level designs in this a bit more. The graphics, obviously, are a bit shined up. Like I said, though, in my previous Wii U impressions video, when you're playing single player, there's basically no uh, functionality with the touchscreen or the Wii U gamepad at all. So it sort of acts as a standalone single player game, which it's fine. It's a it's a fun game, but, you know, I was expecting a little bit more from a new Mario game on the Wii U. But for what it is, it's actually a really fun platformer, and I've been enjoying it so far. Uh, of course, the pack-in game was Nintendo Land, and this game is actually the most impressive in terms of what I own for the use of the Wii U gamepad with the mini games in there. And there are single player games in here, so you can play by yourself. And my favorite one so far is definitely the Ninja Star game. You hold the Wii gamepad, Wii U gamepad like this, and then you flick on the uh, controller while you're aiming with it to shoot out Ninja Stars at these little paper ninjas. It's actually a really fun and challenging little game. It's, um, it's definitely a great packing game, but would I buy this alone for $60? Probably not, but... Nintendo made a really great decision by launching this in North America as a packing game. And probably one of my biggest disappointments for the Wii U, not that it's a bad game, it's actually a really fun little game, but uh, they t the lack of online in this really, really put a damper on it. And that's Tank Tank Tank. I uh, played the Every time I go to the arcades, I always make it a, a, a you know something to do, is to play this game multiplayer with other people. And it's a blast. It's a very arcadey game, uh, and this is a port of the arcade version, and they added in a couple of extra features for multiplayer. But there's no online, so if you're going to be playing this game single player, it gets extremely repetitive. Uh, essentially, you just go from level to level. Think of it as Earth Defense Force Light version, <laughs> is the best way to think of it. Uh, you play as a little tank, and you shoot down giant robot insects and monsters, and you only have uh, two different attacks that you pick up with power-ups that are scattered around the small little arena maps. And you just blast the hell out of everything that's on screen. And uh, it can get a little bit monotonous and repetitive when you're playing single player, which is why it's best to play this game in short bursts. But multiplayer is where it's at, where you can do deathmatch and all sorts of stuff like that. Unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to play this local multiplayer yet, but I assume that that's going to be the way to play Tank Tank Tank. Now, is this a bad game by any means? No, it's a fun great little arcadey dreamcast feeling kind of error game uh, i would only recommend you picking this up unless you definitely can play this local multiplayer and if you can highly recommend it but if you can only play it single player i would wait until this game is in the bargain bin for twenty dollars all right next uh i just got a stack of random games here i'm assuming most of these are from black friday uh first up is dishonored for the xbox 360 this was a Black Friday deal. It was only $25. And you know something that Black Friday really made me realize is it's a really good idea to hold off on buying games when they first come out these days unless you're dying to play them because there were so many games this Black Friday that 
were really, really cheap. And they were not old games by any means. They had come out, you know, just a few months ahead of time. And uh, I decided to pick up Dishonored because I heard really great things about it. And it's it's developed by, um, what is their name? Arcane Studios. And they actually developed uh, Dark Messiah of Might and Magic Elements for the Xbox 360, which is actually one of my favorite little hidden gems from this generation in terms of, you know, action RPGs. That's a really great game. And the fact that they developed this, I'm like, you know what? I'll give it a shot. And I have to say, I'm really pleasantly surprised based on what I've played so far. Uh, I really love the open-endedness of this game. And for those of you that aren't familiar with Dishonored, it's essentially a revenge story set in a first-person stealth action game. You can play it one of two ways, or three ways, actually. You can play it pure carnage, where you just destroy and assassinate everybody. You can play it pure stealth, where you don't even get into a battle or kill anybody the whole game. Or you can mix it up as one of the two. I'm kind of doing a mix-up uh, for myself. That's just the way I prefer to play. It's not an open-world game. However, it's set in linear levels that have an open-endedness in the fact that you can choose the path and goal that you want to take to getting to your objective. So there's never, there's never like a sure fine way to get to where you need to go. There's all these different routes that you can do, all these different objectives to reach that goal. So, for example, one of the standout moments for me so far playing this, and I'm still fairly early on, is you have to get past this electric fence. Now, you can hack the machine to turn it off. Um, you can call a guard over, like, zap all the guards, kill off all the guards. There's all different kind of things. You could turn into a rat and, like, sneak by, because you could possess animals in this game. I just chose to blink up the wall. Blink, essentially, is a teleport ability. I just blinked up the wall, hopped on top of the wall, and just ran across. Just bypassed the whole entire electric gate. And it wasn't a very obvious solution but it was one that I found and I thought that was just so clever and a lot of fun and that's basically how the whole game is there's so many different ways to solve uh, getting to your objectives and your assassination targets and everything that it's it's really a lot of fun I'd highly recommend it I mean for $25 uh, to me it was a steal okay now this one might surprise a lot of people if any of you have been listening to the all gen gamers uh, you probably already know my opinions on this but Sonic All-Star Racing Transform now I will just say this is an excellent game. Uh, by far, it's much better in terms of additions to gameplay and content than the first Sonic and All-Star Racing. Um, but the fact is, I played so much of the original that I got so used to the controls and the characters and, I don't know, just the feel of drifting in that game. And the first game was just so magical, like just experiencing an excellent kart racer for the first time. This game makes a lot of additions with excellent levels, really good music. A lot of new characters, just a lot of new refinements to the gameplay. However, it does control differently, and I'm finding it hard to adjust to that. I'm just not feeling it as much as the first one. Um, the weapons just are kind of flat in this. They're not really that exciting. Um, you can transform into planes and boats. The planes are pretty fun. The boats are flat out hard to control, and they're not that much fun. Now, I will just say that I don't like this as much as the first one so far from what I've played, to be quite honest. Um, the first one just has some sort of magic that's lost for me in the second one. However, I'm going to be in the minority. 95% of you are going to absolutely love this game over the first. And if you've never played the first game, ditch it in the Dutch that dust and just pick up this one. This is the definitive version of Sonic All-Star. I'm just in a very weird minority where I'm sort of like stuck in my attachment for the first one. Still over this one. I'm still going to try to go back and play some more of this, though. It's definitely a really fun game. Akai Katana. Um, I don't remember if I had mentioned this before, but I did pick this up when it came out, so... I don't know. I didn't play it when I picked it up, so I have now, so I can't even remember if I mentioned it, but... This is a cave bullet hell shooter, um, and you should know what that means. Lots of bullets on screen, really challenging, and a lot of fun. This is not an entry-level shooter by any means for cave fans, um... It's got a lot of mechanics to it where you have to switch between two different stances to reflect bullets, to power up your shots, to switch between gathering like two different material types to power up your weapons in this game. It's it's a pretty complex game. It took me a while to play it, and anytime I go back to try and play it, I always have to spend five minutes readjusting myself to all the controls and nuances in this game. But once you get it down, it really opens up into a really fun shoot 'em up. There's different modes you can play, but my mode of preference is slash mode, uh, essentially where you can power up um, like these katanas that you can shoot out at enemies and it just decimates everything on screen. 
This is more of a score-based shooter. Uh, I kind of prefer to play my shooters on a, a, a sense of not dying, trying to get as far as I can without dying. This game, I wouldn't really play it for that. It's more for score, getting a high score. So anybody that's a fan of bullet hell shooters, definitely check out Akai Katana. All right, a couple of Black Friday deals here. I haven't had a chance to play them yet because I picked them up when I was still really busy because they were super cheap and I couldn't let them go by. Sly Cooper Collection, 10 bucks, brand new on PS3. Uh, most of my deals I got from Amazon as well. God of War Saga, this was only $15 for um, the two PSP God of War games and all three of the original God of War games. So considering I've only played, well, I beat the first God of War and I played a very little bit of God of War 2. I'm definitely looking forward to going back and trying to maybe start with the first one, but I think I'm just going to start with the second and play until the third, because I really want to play the third. Little Big Planet Carding. This was only $25 on Amazon, and I was almost going to buy this game when it came out for $60. Thank God I didn't, because I would have been really upset. I did play this when I was at PAX Prime, and it was actually a lot of fun, so I'm looking forward to giving this a shot. Under Defeat HD. Um, what is this? They call it Deluxe Edition. Now, this is a Dreamcast shooter that is known for its very unique premise that there's no power-ups, per se, in this game. There's no, like, increasing your shot radius or your spread on your shot or anything crazy like that. You have one machine gun, and that's it, and then you have your options. And there's three different options, options with little ships that follow you around. And the options are the only things you get to change in the game in terms of your weapons. But what's really unique about it is you can change the shot direction. So the default controls is that you um, the left stick will move you left and right, like pretend this is your ship pointing forward. You use your joystick and it'll pivot your uh, ship left and right, and you can still turn, because if you turn left, your ship's going to go like this. Turn right, it's going to go like that, or you can inverse it. Um, then there's a control option where you can use the right joystick so that you can move and aim with the right joystick. That's the kind of one I prefer. But that's what makes it really unique, because most shooters don't allow you to um, change the direction of your fire. The only one that I've played that does that is Guardian Force on the Sega Saturn, which is a great game, by the way. Uh, but this one, I would say, is much better than Guardian Force. It's a, it's a really fun game. Very, very challenging. But anybody that's looking for a great shooter um, for their PS3, it's on... Is it on 360? No, I think it's 360 in Europe only or something like that. Something weird. But US owners, pick it up on the PS3. I got the Ratchet and Clank collection. This was only $15, normally $40. You get all the Ratchet and Clank games. What do they give you on here? Ratchet and Clank 1. One command to up your arsenal. Uh, yeah, and those are the three you get. So not every single one, but for that price, 15 bucks, I can pass it up. I picked this up a while back, um, and that's Zionide. This is a um, shoot 'em up, believe it or not, on the original Xbox. And uh, I haven't had a chance to play it yet, but it's sort of a, a very unknown game. I didn't even know it existed until a few months back when I was looking up lists online of weird Xbox games that no one's played. And uh, this came up, so I picked it up. It was very cheap. It was only a couple of dollars on eBay. Okay, uh, still got a lot of handheld games over here. Let me just grab a stack of them. All right, first up is Code of Princess for the Nintendo 3DS. This is known as the spiritual successor to Guardian Heroes on the Sega Saturn. And this game is a lot of fun. It's got online multiplayer. It's got a really crazy art style to it like this game looks really really good there's tons of enemies on screen at times and it plays like a 2d side scrolling beat em up but with uh, little bits of rpg elements and a little bit of fighting game influence in there too because you have to do different bu uh, button combinations to do your attacks uh, i haven't cleared it yet um like fully the entire game but i have been playing it with many different characters kind of jumping around between their different stories and i've played some online the online is okay um it's definitely not as good as it could be uh, but it's it's a good addition, I guess you can say. Uh, there are quite a bit of lag issues, at least when I was playing it. But yeah, if anybody anybody out there that's a fan of beat em ups and you have a 3DS, definitely pick up uh, Code of Princess. All right, Kingdom Hearts uh, Birth. Uh, sorry, Kingdom Hearts. Okay, Kingdom Hearts Dream Drop Distance. This was another Black Friday deal. Only $15, and I was almost going to pick this game up when it was brand new for $40. So, once again, really glad I didn't. I played the demo of this game, and I did enjoy the combat system, despite not following the Kingdom Hearts series in terms of the story. I'm going to try and give this one a shot and just see if I can 
sort of play through it and maybe get a sense of the story. I'm still not sure how that'll work out. Uh, Ragnarok Tactics on the PSP. This is a game for anybody out there that's a fan of old school tactical RPGs. This is a late release on the PSP, so it might be a little bit hard to find in the future, so pick it up all you can. But what I love about this game so much is it doesn't have any frills, like no gameplay mechanics that make it like weird to stand out, like Gungnir on the PS3 or uh, PSP or anything like that, or Knights of the Nightmare. Like it's not one of those out of you know weird tactical RPGs where it adds some sort of mechanic to stand out from everything else. It's just straight up level your characters, level up their skills, equip you know bring new characters onto your team, and just advance through the story. And it's a really really fun game. It's got a great visual style to it. Um, the story is very interesting because you can pick between different sides. You can play on the the good side or the evil side, or what appears to be the evil side so far. Um, characters, really well well written game, uh, very well translated. And anybody that's a fan of Final Fantasy Tactics, definitely look into Ragnarok Tactics. For the PlayStation Vita, I picked up Hatsune Miku Project Diva F. This is an import game. And this is a huge series outside of America. Well, it's pretty popular here, but in Japan, this thing is huge. This thing will sell systems. But this is a music rhythm game starring this little Sega mascot, I guess you can say. This is almost like Sega's mascot over Sonic the Hedgehog now in Japan, I have to say. Uh, Hatsune Miku. And, I don't know, it's just pretty simple. You just tap the buttons to the, um, the notes that fly on screen. You tap and hold, and sometimes you have to swipe on the screen. Uh, it's basically a, a really unique sounding pop style. There's all different kinds of song styles in this game, but all of them are sung with this Vocaloid uh, voice, I guess you can say, which is essentially a synthesized voice of these different characters, but they uh, they sound pretty good. You know, you can kind of tell they're a little bit weird sounding like a robot, but it has a really unique sound to it. It's a fun game. It's Vita's region free, so go ahead and import it. The language barrier is definitely not that hard at all. It's very easy to get around without knowing Japanese. Persona 4 Golden, or Persona 4 The Golden, whichever you prefer. Uh, I've been playing this quite a bit. Uh, I'm about 18 hours into it so far, and I have to say this is a must-buy for the Vita. For anybody that's a fan of RPGs, or if you're a fan of the original Persona, the new content is so worth it. The game looks amazing on the Vita. Like I've said, the Persona 4 has the best characters I've ever played in an RPG when it comes to character development. I absolutely love the characters in here. The story is engrossing, the, set in, it says, the setting is engrossing. Definitely pick this up. You do not have to play Persona 3 before you play Persona 4. They're different universes. Think It's like a Final Fantasy game. Every game is different. So definitely, if you have a Vita or you're thinking about picking up a Vita, this is one of the first games you should pick up if you like RPGs. Uh, for the Vita, I also picked up Ragnarok Odyssey, the collector's edition, which is a really nice collector's edition, by the way. And this game plays very similar to a Monster Hunter game, where it's a four-player online monster hunting material gathering game. And um, it gets very repetitive. If you're not into games where you have to repeat missions a lot of times in the same settings, definitely avoid this game. But for anybody that's played Fantasy Star or Monster Hunter, you know exactly what you're getting into here. And the game's fun. It's got amazing graphics. I put actually a lot of time into this game. I think I put like 35, 40 hours into it. And uh, that's not even beating it, because it takes a long time to play online. Really fun game. I was playing as a cleric. There's different classes. There's warriors. There's the cleric. Um, they call the warriors, like, sword masters, something like that. I forget what they call them exactly, but there's a class that uses the hammers, the hammersmith. Um, there's the mage. There's the ninja-type class, uh, the assassin. So there's all different types of classes you can play as, and the bosses you fight in here are really, really impressive at times. Early on, they're still pretty small, but the further you get into the game, you fight some huge bosses, which is a lot of fun. Um, like I said, it's definitely not an RPG for everybody, but if you like these kind of games, definitely check it out. Okay, for the 3DS, I picked up Harvest Moon 3D, a new beginning. And I uh, have to say, first impressions, I like this a lot more than A Tale of Two Towns. This Harvest Moon game starts off really slow uh, in terms of getting going. There's only three villagers. The village is very empty. All you do for the first few hours in this game is just water your crops and gather materials and sell them, essentially. Um, so it takes a while to get going, but I have to say I really like that slow progression. I like the slow build-up, the slow introduction of characters. I think it's really great. 
Anybody that's looking for a really good entry-level uh, Harvest Moon game, definitely check this out. It really holds your hand in terms of teaching you the mechanics of this game. Maybe a little bit too much. But, uh, yeah, really fun game. Check it out if you're interested in getting into the Harvest Moon series. Or if you really like Harvest Moon, it's definitely a game worth checking out. Uh, Epic Mickey, The Power of Illusion. I put quite a bit of time into this game so far. Um, I actually wrote uh, impressions for this on my website, which you, I'll post the link to below if you want to go check that out. But it's actually a really good platformer that has one problem. The painting mechanics in this really slows down the gameplay. You're well, Most of the time, you have to stop and paint objects in or out of the screen on the touchpad. And while sometimes it's used in really clever ways, like in puzzle-oriented ways, it really does slow down the gameplay. And that's really a shame because this is actually a very solid, beautiful-looking 2D platformer that is a spiritual sequel to the Castle of Illusion game on the Sega Genesis and the Mega Drive and the Game Gear, I guess, if you want to say, and the Sega Master System, if you want to say that, too. Uh, definitely still check it out if you can get it pretty cheap, if you're a fan of platformers or the Mickey platformers in general. If you can look past that one glaring flaw, it's actually a very good game. Okay, I got two N-Gage games here, two games that I've been wanting to add in my collection for a very long time, and they're two of the rarer games on the system, especially for the U.S., and that's High Seas. This is a turn-based strategy RPG of sorts that plays very similar to Advanced Wars, except instead of tanks and stuff, you play with all ships in the sea. It's actually supposed to be a really good game, one of the best on the N-Gage. You couldn't buy this in stores, actually. This this was only available on an N-Gage website after the N-Gage was basically dead. You can only mail order this online. Same thing with this, Warhammer 40,000 Death and Glory. This is known as one of the rarest games in the U.S. library. Another turn-based strategy RPG. And this is the same case, one of the late. Well, actually, I think this might be the last release in the U.S. for the N-Gage, and it was only available online. Um, so definitely looking forward to trying both these games out. They are, by the way, I want to kill some of you N-Gage collectors out there, but they are sealed. However, I do plan on opening them to play them, because I really, really want to play both of these games. All right, let's see what else we got. A um, couple more Black Friday pickups. I know it's a little jumping around here, a little bit random, but Dirt Showdown for the Xbox 360. This came from GameStop. Ten bucks. And anything that's like a Destruction Derby type game, I'm all for it. So for ten dollars, looking forward to trying this out. Journey Collector's Edition. I was waiting for this to drop in price, and it did. This was only fifteen dollars, was it? Or no, this was ten dollars, I think, on GameStop.com. And you know, I have all the games except for Flow, but I think it's worth it alone just to um, to watch the documentaries and the extra features on here. So check this game out. If you have not played uh, Flower and especially Journey, pick this game up by all means. All right, here's a game. I think this was also, yeah, this was 10 or 15, I forget. But a brand new copy of Witcher 2 Assassin King's Enhanced Edition, sort of like a collector's edition. Couldn't beat that. I mean... I, I've heard really good things about this. Um, I probably should have picked it up on PC for the graphic-wise, but eh, whatever. Couldn't beat it for this price and having like a special edition for it. Yeah, whatever. Uh, I've heard really good things. I've played the first Witcher on the PC, which I did like. I never finished it, though, because that's a pretty robust game. So I'm hoping I can get into this and enjoy the story. And this was 25 I think. I forget exactly. But this was from Amazon or 30 something like that. Um, Record of Agris War 2. Now, for the longest time, I was under the impression that the Record of Agris 4 games were all, like, this weird turn-based strategy game, but it actually ends up that this here in the series, some of them were more grid-based. This is actually a pretty cool-looking turn-based RPG that sort of brings back memories of Xenogears for me in terms of the combat system. It looks really interesting, and for the cheap price that I got it at, I couldn't pass this up. Okay, moving quickly along here, let's move on to... Um, yeah, let's just do this stack of games here. Okay, so I got an import for the PS1, a game I've wanted for a really long time, and it's a game by Treasure. Yes, we all know Treasure and their great gems that are out there. This is exclusive for the PS1, and it's a fighting game with a really unique art style, and that's Rakugaki Showtime. Now, I will definitely be probably doing a video on this in the future, um, and I really mean that, because this game, I haven't seen any game like this in terms of graphical style. It's a uh, think of it as a Power Stone type um, beat em up fighting game with this sort of cardboard cutout paper crayon style artwork. It's incredibly, incredibly cool looking. 
and I hope the gameplay is fun enough to back it up, but I just could not not pick this game up based on the graphics alone. And it's by Treasure, so that tells you something there. It should be pretty good. I got a reproduction of a new TurboGrafx CD game, and that is Mysterious Song. Now, I don't know the full history of this, but I'm pretty sure this is sort of a, a TurboGrafx port or remake of a PC RPG, I think, that was pretty old. Um, like I said, I don't know the history, but it looks like a pretty basic, excuse me, pretty basic turn-based um, RPG for the Turbo Graphics. Haven't had a chance to play it yet, but definitely looking forward to popping this in some time and spending some time with it. Uh, LSD. Now, this is a game that I mentioned in the last episode. This is one of the craziest looking PS1 games I've ever played. It also happens to be one of the most rare and expensive. Uh, but you know me, I like those weird, crazy, wacky games, and I had to pick this up. I imported it, so I didn't have to pay the crazy high prices that it tends to go for on eBay. But uh, this is a dream emulator. The story behind this game, if there is a story, is that this guy in Japan kept the diary of his dreams for like years, and then he translated it all into a video game. And the sole purpose of this game is you wander around these creepy, dreamlike, nightmarish worlds where you just wander around. And that's all you do. You just explore, and if you bump into something, you'll be transported to another area. Now, there is sort of a mechanic behind it where you can choose where you're going to go next, but I don't know exactly what it is, and I prefer not to know. One of the strangest, weirdest, creepiest, wacky games I've ever played. I'll probably do a video on this one just so you guys can see how weird this game is. Okay, a couple of Saturday, uh, Sega Saturn imports here. Stellar Assault. Super happy to have this. Um, this is a sequel to, uh, what is it? Um, oh, I forget the name of it, but there is, um, oh, Shadow, I think it's Shadow Assault or Shadow Squadron on the Sega 32X. This is its sequel. However, what makes this game look really awesome is the graphics. I just love the graphics in this game. Um, it's a first person spaceship battle game, and it looks really good. I I don't know, it reminds me a lot of Star Wars Arcade on the 32X graphic-wise. Um, definitely looking forward to playing this. It's not a cheap game, it's fairly uncommon, but it's one I've wanted for my collection ever since I started importing, or getting into imports for the Sega Saturn. This is a side-scrolling, shoot-em-up-esque action game, and that's Wolf Fang. Now, this is also on the PlayStation 1, but from what I remember, there's something about that version that uh, is not as good as the Saturn version, so that's why I got this version. But it's a mech-based, um, side-scrolling action platformer shoot-em-up hybrid, which looks like a lot of fun. It looks pretty challenging as well. Okay, um, I think I'll move on to some Super Famicom games. And I've picked up a lot since uh, I started collecting. I really enjoy collecting for the Super Famicom. I love the boxes for the system, but not only that, the artwork is awesome, and there's a lot of great exclusives for the Super Famicom, or versions of games that are cheaper on the Super Famicom, that um, are import-friendly, that you don't have to spend hundreds of dollars for to get the alternative version, which you'll see in a second here what I mean. This game here is, um, I forget the Japanese title, but it's like Sandra no Die something, but the, the title in Europe is Worlo which I'm sure people in Europe will know exactly what I mean. That game is a few hundred dollars. It's one of the more expensive games on the Super Famicom or the Super Nintendo uh, in Europe. This never made it to America, but the Japanese copy is a very cheap alternative. This is a challenging side-scrolling platformer starring this little cute, adorable green guy here. So I got that for a great price, and I'm looking forward to trying that out. Uh, Next up, we have a game here that I'm very excited to finally have, and it's one of the more rare games on the Super Famicom, and that is Magical Poppin'. This is a platformer that is exclusive to the Japanese Super Famicom. It's known as being one of the best games in terms of platformers for the system, and uh, it's, it's not a linear platformer. There are different paths that you can take, from what I understand. It's not like on the scale of Super Metroid, but... Uh, it's got a little bit of non-linearity to it, and it looks like a ton of fun. I mean, I love classic 2D platformers, and when I saw this game, you know, years ago, I was like, man, I would love to own that. And now that I finally do, can't wait to dive into this one. Okay, I got Umehara Kawase, I believe is the name of this. I haven't looked it up recently, but I think that's what this is called. Uh, this here is another 2D platformer exclusive to the Super Famicom. However, this version... It was ported to um, 
There is one on the DS, and then there's one on the PSP. I'm pretty sure the DS one, I could be wrong, I think the DS one is a new game, and then the PSP one is a port of this. I don't, I'm not sure, I don't have my facts right, but this game is available on other platforms in one form or another. Uh, now this is a really cool platformer because you get this little chain whip that lets you, like, pivot around obstacles. Really fun, unique looking game. If you guys want to see videos on any of these, just let me know and I will definitely put one together for you. Uh, this is Macross uh, Scrambled Valkyrie. And this is a 2D side-scrolling shoot-em-up known as one of the best that never made it outside of Japan from the Super Famicom. I've had a chance to play it. Very challenging, but oh my god, this game looks amazing. This is a really good shoot-em-up. So if any of you have the chance to pick this up, definitely look into it. Now this here is another game that's a great example of why it's good to have a Super Famicom, because you can get games like Hagane, which go for hundreds, like five to six hundred dollars for a complete copy uh, in US and Europe, when you can get it in Japan for less than a hundred. Now this in US was exclusive to Blockbuster rentals only. That's why it makes it so rare. In Japan it was a standard release, so I've heard it's a really great challenging 2D side-scrolling action game, so I'm looking forward to seeing what all the hype is about. Uh, this game here is uh, Magic Magic Kur Kurukun or something like that. Uh, oh, Magic Adventure. Good enough. Uh, this is another 2D side-scrolling platformer that... There's a version of this also on the Mega Drive, but they're actually two different games. This one here, uh, the sprites aren't quite as blown up and cartoony. It's a little bit more scaled back, but it looks like a really fun game. This is a side-scrolling shoot-em-up exclusive to the Super Famicom, and that is Flying Hero. And it looks like a lot of fun. It's sort of in that vein of a parody, Parodius-style shooter, um, or shoot-em-up, if you want to say. And um, it's definitely not a common game. It's, it's pretty hard to get a hold of, and I'm looking forward to playing it. He plays like this little egg guy. I don't know. <laughs> pretty weird looking. Okay. Um, oh, I also got this. I almost forgot. The Zone of the Enders HD Collection. Now, this was an amazing deal. For only $60, you get it in this nice slipcase with an art book, and I, they give you the soundtrack in there, too, I think. Um, I forget, it's been a while since I opened it up, but for that price, I couldn't pass it up, and I never played the second Zone of the Enders, and I absolutely love the first, so I can't wait to try out the first one again, because it's only a couple of hours, and then play the second one, because I've heard it's much better than the first. Okay, really fast, I'm going to go through these here. Uh, these are just some Sega Genesis reproduction games, or the first one is a Master System reproduction of Power Strike 2. Now, this is a reproduction of the European copy, which is um, exclusive to Europe. This is not um, Power Strike 2 that's on the Game Gear, also known as Game Gear Super LS2. But this is um, just a uh, American regionalized port for Power Strike 2 in Europe, which is a pretty expensive and rare game. And, um, yeah, this is a compile shooter, and I'm looking forward to trying this out, because I definitely like the first Power Strike on the Master System. This is pretty awesome. This is a reproduction of Dark Side on the 32X. Now, a lot of people know this, especially collectors, as being an extremely rare and expensive game that only came out in Europe, which fetches upwards of $1,000 when it's in good, complete condition. And, uh, yeah, this is a reproduction complete with um, cartridge and everything, so... One time I'll hook up my 32X. It's been a while since I hooked it up and give it a try. It's a very impressive looking 32X game. Uh, Snow Brothers Dick and Tom. This is known as being a very expensive and rare Mega Drive import game. And now I have a US copy. That was nice and cheap. So it's sort of uh, similar to, um, well, Nightmare in the Dark or uh, what is that other one? I don't know. It's one of those action games where um, you hit the enemies and you combo them and then you knock the ball down and it hits into all the other enemies. You guys know exactly what I'm talking about. I haven't played much of that genre of game, I have to say, so this is going to be uh, one of the first ones I really get into. Alien Soldier. Uh, yeah, this never came out in America, Japan, and in PAL regions only, and it's a pretty rare game over, over there, so having a US copy is great. I have this on the Wii Virtual Console, but the fact that I can actually play it on real hardware was pretty appealing to me, and Looking forward to trying this out once again. It's a very hard game. Um, another game by Treasure. Slap Fight MD. This is another uh, Mega Drive Japan exclusive shoot 'em up. Never made it outside of Japan. It's a pretty rare and ex uh, expensive game. Um, this actually has music by Yuzo Koshiro, 
uh, so for those of you that are familiar with Streets of Rage or the Etrian Odyssey soundtracks, just to name a couple, he did the music for this game, and it's pretty awesome. So happy to have that. Battle Mania 2, which is another side-scrolling shooter that never made it to America. I think this was exclusive to Japan, but I've heard really good things about this one, so definitely looking forward to that. And a game I've heard great things about, and that is Pulseman, a side-scrolling platformer with this guy that uses, like, really fast-paced electric powers, and he zips around. It looks very similar to Sonic, but, you know, you can compare most fast platformers uh, from the 90s to Sonic the Hedgehog, but this one sort of has a really unique look and feel to it that I'm looking forward to checking out. I've heard great things about it. Okay, um, got some more Sega Saturn games here. Another import, I forget the name, uh, I think it's Ninja Jajamaru, I think. Could be wrong on that, but this is a fairly, actually pretty uncommon game on the Sega Saturn, and I got this for an excellent price. It's sort of a behind-the-view action platforming game. It's pretty hard to describe, if you guys, like I said, I have plenty, of, in the next month and a half, I'm going to have plenty of time. I plan on doing a lot of quick little review videos on a lot of these weird, quirky games, especially for those of you that are planning on getting into importing games. I got a lot of great hidden gems out there that I want to let you guys know about, and this will probably be one of them. Um, okay, moving on. I picked up a couple of Sega Saturn games that I got for a really great price. Uh, unfortunately, not all of them were in the condition I thought they would be in, but for the price I paid... Yeah, it was pretty much worth it. Um, I got Dragon Force for the Sega Saturn. Definitely really happy to have this. This is one of the final games that I needed to complete my Sega Saturn RPG collection um, and my working designs collection. I think the only game I need now for my working designs collection is Sega Ages, and then I'll be done. So I heard excellent things about this game. Uh, it's a turn-based strategy game, but it has like this really big epic war scale to it. When you, um, when you fight the enemy, it's not just like a one-on-one -on -one thing, it's hundreds and hundreds on one another. It's a really great looking game. Okay, next, uh, like I said, this one, the next two were not in the condition I thought they'd be in. It wasn't said in the description they'd be like this, but I got it so cheap I can't complain too much. Uh, Shinobi Legends on the Sega Saturn now. Yes, the front cover is missing. Everything else is intact though, uh, but the manual is really terrible, so I gotta try and get a replacement manual. If any of you have one or know someone that does that's willing to sell it, let me know. But uh, looking forward to playing this. It's sort of hit or miss with a lot of fans, because it uses, like, real uh, movies and stuff and animations for the characters instead of sprite work, so, yeah, some fans absolutely hate it. Uh, next is another game where the condition wasn't exactly like I thought it would be, but now I just need a case for it, is Guardian Heroes on the Sega Saturn. However, it's in a Mortal Kombat 2 case, unfortunately. Um, so, yeah, if any of you know a case for Guardian Heroes, uh, not the manual or the CD, just the case with the backing artwork and the side spine art, let me know. But I'm definitely happy to have an original version of this, because I, I do have it on the Japanese import Saturn, and um, I have it on the Xbox 360, but to have an original copy is, is great. Now, let's see, i got two more Saturn games here, and then one that I'm super excited to have for another system. Uh, Night Warriors, Darkstalkers, Revenge, so... Uh, I'm not the biggest fan of fighting games anymore, but I definitely do appreciate the classics, and I do have fond memories of the Darkstalkers game, so I'm happy to have Night Warriors. And lastly, Dark Savior. Um, this is another sort of puzzle action RPG for the Saturn that I've never played, and I've heard really mixed things on, so looking forward to trying this out. It's gotten a lot of comparisons to being the spiritual sequel to Landstalker on the Genesis, so we'll see how that holds up. Now this, this game right here. I don't know if any of you can read that. Konami. Uh, there's a card in there. Now, I did know this didn't come with the manual, but for the price that everything came together for, um, <laughs> yeah, I got, finally, Snatcher for the Sega CD. comes with everything but the manual, and the, the CD is in really good condition. I'll just have to track down a manual, uh, buy it separately. But I can't tell you how excited I am to have Snatcher, because this game has gone up in value. Let's just say that the price that Snatcher goes for is the price that I paid for all of these games, plus others um, that I'm, like, selling to, to recoup money. So essentially I'm getting, like, all these games for next to nothing. Um, but Snatcher these days sells for two to three hundred dollars. And, you know, no, there's no manual, but I'll be able to play it in the meantime until I get the manual for it. But I've heard so many great things about Snatcher, and I just found out I remembered I had a Justifier gun, which hopefully still works. I can play this with the gun. I know I'm holding this up, and all you see is that. I'm better off holding it like this. Uh, 
But yeah, I can't wait to dive in the Snatcher, especially because it was getting super, super expensive. And to be able to play it <laughs> and get it for a good price these days is pretty hard to do. I've been working on bulking up my Super Nintendo Complete and Box collection, and I got a lot of great games for a good price. Clay Fighter. Um, Act Razor 2. Very excited to have this. Um, yeah, it throws out the god elements and the simulation aspects of the first one, but to be honest, I wasn't the biggest fan of that in the first place for the first game. So this is just straight-up side-scrolling action, supposedly really challenging, and it looks like an excellent game. Arcana. I'm really excited to play this one because it's a uh, first-paced, turn-based dungeon crawler, but it has music by um, the Kirby series, because so, it's made by HAL, HAL Laboratories, or HAL America, if you want to call it that. And... Uh, yeah, I'm really excited to play this, because not only does the music kick ass, but I've been craving a new old-school dungeon crawler. Uh, Maui Millard in Cold Shadow. This is a Don Donald Duck platformer that actually looks really, really good. The animation and the colors in this game look phenomenal, and uh, can't wait to try that out. I got Donkey Kong Country 2 and 3 complete in the box, and most of these games are in like excellent condition. And um, It's been a while since I've played 2 and 3. I've actually... I rented these back in the day because they were way too expensive to buy when they were brand new. I think they were like $100, so to finally own complete copies of these two games is really pretty special. Uh, Alien 3, I've played and loved the Genesis version, despite that being a very hard game, so I'm excited to try out the Super Nintendo version. Earthworm Jim 2, I've played it on the Genesis, so I'm looking forward to seeing how it holds up on the Super Nintendo. Lagoon, a very mixed uh, RPG, action top-down RPG that some people absolutely hate because of the combat. And some people actually really like, so I'm looking forward to checking this out someday and seeing what I think of it. And lastly, Super Alfred Chicken. Yeah, I don't know, it came with some other games, so whatever, I have it now, and it's some kind of platformer with a chicken. So there you go, guys, that's just a quick, I guess you can say, update on all the games I bought recently. And if I play some of these games in the meantime, I'll be sure to update you in a Games I Played Recently video, and expect some videos and reviews on some of these games in the future. As always, thanks for watching.